Is your startup accessible to all? Happy birthday, Pac-Man. And if you use an iPhone 4, you're going to want to stick around. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 344 for Friday, May 22nd, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all of the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney, and this is the show where we talk about the tech news with the experts behind the headlines. Now let's get to today's big news. 9 to 5 Mac reports that Apple's new iOS will be optimized for older iPhones. Joining us to talk about this is Selena Larson from The Daily Dot. Welcome, Selena. Hi, how's it going? It's going great. Thanks for coming back. So Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference is just a few weeks away. We're hearing lots of Apple news and rumors about iOS 9. It might use the Apple Watch San Francisco typeface, which I am a fan of. We should expect an upgraded Apple Maps, and it's unlikely that this update will leave legacy devices behind. Tell us more about this last rumor. Yeah, so um, it's something that I'm particularly excited about. I know uh, when my I upgraded my 4S to iOS 7 a while ago, it completely borked it. Um, it was basically rendered completely unusable. Um, and so for a long time, people thought that, oh, well, you know, is Apple trying to convince um, people to upgrade their devices, you know, every couple of years to, to go along with the software? Um, but uh, yeah, 9 to 5 Mac, they uh, reported today that um, they are optimizing iOS 9 for older devices. So that means like the 4S and the Mini. Um, the, the original mini will be able to um, upgrade and there won't be that, you know, sluggish issue that um, so many older devices have when they try and run uh, new Apple software. Right. And they said that they didn't mention the iPad 2 by name, but they assume that also that will be included. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, and the other cool thing about this, too, is it is um, good news for Apple Watch owners. I know um, for when uh, the wearable was launched, a lot of people were kind of skeptical about um, investing, you know, a few hundred to a few thousand dollars in a piece of technology that um, could potentially be out of date with, you know, just a few software upgrades. Um, but I feel like, I mean, this to me shows um, that Apple's like really invested in making sure that um, these legacy devices and these um these, you know, like the Apple Watch and, and any new phones that they make are going to be compatible um, with any future software updates. So you are going to be able to have your um, your Apple Watch for a while. And um, and hopefully this, you know, like the software won't necessarily um, make it so that you need to buy an entirely new device. Right. I assume you're not still using that iPhone 4. I am not. I'm actually still on a 5S and the screen is completely cracked. So... <laughs> I think it's probably time for me to upgrade. <laughs> right. Well, let's move on to another story you posted about accessibility. Uh, you have a story about one man uh, who, to celebrate Global Accessibility Awareness Day, which was yesterday, uh, one man who's trying to ex keep accessibility on web developers' mind. Uh, for people who might not know what accessibility means in the, in the tech sense, uh, explain a little bit about what it means. Yeah, so essentially accessibility is making your apps and software able to be used by anyone. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of people who are, have um, vision disabilities, hearing disabilities, um, physical disabilities, it makes it very difficult to operate um, a computer or um, mobile apps um, sometimes can't use apps and services that um, that other people can simply because um, because either through like vision loss or hearing loss or just they're not able to tap like everyone else. Um, it, it really limits uh, a lot of times the software that they can use. So um, Jenison, who I actually profiled in this um, in this article, he founded Global Accessibility Awareness Day, um, and he's now the head of accessibility over at LinkedIn. And so he's really devoted to um, making sure um, companies, whether they be small startups all the way to large uh, corporations, are making sure that anyone can use their software. Um, and uh, so, so Global Accessibility Awareness Day is pretty cool because they have events all across the world. And in fact, Jensen was telling me that he was on the phone with some folks in Paris asking for advice on how to make um, how to make these events uh, special and, and, and help developers and, and startups um, make their apps, um, test them for, um, for how they perform um, with accessibility. So, um, so it's really great. Essentially, it just brings a bunch of people together, a lot of developers together to, to think about that and start actively thinking about that. 
And one of the things that he talked about was when um, startups build their apps or services, right? Um, unless you're building for a, an audience of people with disabilities, you don't often think about building accessibility into your apps. So that's basically the goal with this um, this annual event is to make people start thinking about it. Right, it's interesting because it's hard. I mean, I used to work for Microsoft and part of what I did is I worked for their accessibility team uh, and you know, they're a giant corporation. So they not only have the funds to think about accessibility and the people and the staff, but they're also, a lot of people are always, you know, making sure they are looking at accessibility. You know, someone's always watching them to make sure, but it's the, the startups that no one is really watching that, um, you know, really have to uh, work on that themselves and find mm -hmm. a way to pay for it and, and you know, for, for everyone, so that's interesting. Yeah, absolutely, and Jenison was talking to um, that if you start at the very begin beginning and build in accessibility into your app, it cuts the time and effort and financial investment that you're gonna need to make down the road, right? So if you're actively thinking about this at the very beginning, um, it's pretty easy, well, you know, easy in terms of, of software development, you know, to, to build in accessibility into your apps and services. And, and it's not just for, it, because it's the right thing to do, right? But it expands your audience and it expands your customer base. And it's interesting that you say that big companies have the resources to do this. Well, one of the things that actually brought Jenison over to LinkedIn was he had called them out he, on their lack of accessibility in a particular thing that he was doing because he himself is blind. So he has that experience and that understanding of what it's like being um, on the internet as a person with a disability. And so he was using LinkedIn and he, he stumbled across this feature that he couldn't use. And so he reached out to them and said, hey, I would like to point out that this is a problem. And he actually went into the office and like sat down with them and chatted with them about that. And that's sort of how he became their accessibility lead. And He's just, he does that to a lot of, for a lot of companies, a lot of, uh, a lot of startups, he'll say, oh, I'm trying to use your app, but I can't. And um, he really likes to try and open that dialogue and get more and more people thinking about um, making apps accessible to everyone. Well, Selena, thank you so much. Uh, Selena Larson is a staff writer at The Daily Dot. I know you're in San Francisco. Are you going to be um, stopping by Google I.O. next week? Um, actually, I won't be there. Um, we are having, we have a lot of crazy staffing things, so I'll be out again um, over uh, in, in our offices. But, um, but yeah, I am, I'll be covering it. And um, if you guys want to chat with me about Google I.O. or any other tech stuff, feel free to send me a tweet at Selena Larson on Twitter and um, check me out on dailydot.com. Thank you, Selena. Take care. Thank you. Coming up, rich people throw money at Uber and Microsoft will not be throwing money at Salesforce. But first, we all love to eat, but it's hard to find a meal that doesn't compromise somewhere. Good value, quick to prepare, healthy and delicious. That is where Blue Apron comes in. Blue Apron makes cooking delicious meals easy and fun. They deliver fresh, ready to cook meals right to your doorstep at your home or at your office. For less than $10 per, per meal, Blue Apron sends you fresh ingredients, perfectly proportioned with step-by-step -step recipe instructions, including beautifully printed pictures. That makes cooking health meals, healthy meals really easy and fun. No trips to the grocery store and no waste from the unused ingredients. Blue Apron is perfect for date night, for cooking with friends. I have gotten the family plan and it's great to cook with kid-friendly ingredients, foods that your kids will actually eat, and the whole family can sit down and eat well. Each balanced meal is 500 to 700 calories per serving, and so yummy you would never know. Cooking takes half an hour, shipping is free, and the menus are always new. They won't send the same meal twice. They work around your schedule and dietary preferences, and Blue Apron's experts source only the best ingredients for incredible meals like flat iron steaks with ramps, fingerling potatoes and shaved asparagus salad, and rice flake crusted hake with sauteed daikon radish and yuzu soy sauce. You'll cook incredible meals and be blown away by the quality and freshness. Blue Apron, it's a better way to cook. Check out this week's menu and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's right, two free meals just for going to blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Tonight. 
Now on to a few more stories we're following today. A few weeks ago, we reported that Microsoft was planning on buying Salesforce. That was according to the rumor. That's a company whose lucrative customer relationship management software and cloud computing business looked pretty good to Microsoft. Today, CNBC says that Microsoft did make a bid for the cloud computing company, but their offer was too low. According to sources close to the matter, Microsoft offered $55 billion and Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff was holding out for $70 billion. And then the talks fell through. Taking a page from Apple's You Can Never Have Too Much Money playbook, Uber is seeking another $1 billion credit line from banks, according to Quartz. We're not sure what Uber is going to use that money for, perhaps to buy Nokia's map unit known as Here. That's the rumor. Last month, Uber's latest round of fundraising netted the company $1.5 billion with a $41 billion valuation. The New York Times implied that the company is now raising money not because they need it, but because lots of people are falling all over themselves to give it to them. Apparently, rich people really like Uber. A company in Hawaii is suing Oculus VR, claiming that the Facebook-owned virtual reality company misappropriated confidential information and proprietary technology. This according to a piece in the Wall Street Journal this evening. Oculus Rift has been sued before. This claim comes from Total Recall Technologies, who argue that their former employee, Oculus founder Palmer Lucky, built a prototype for a head-mounted display while working at their company and then used that information to create the Oculus Rift headset. The company's name is Total Recall Technologies. Did they not see the movie Total Recall? It does not make virtual reality look very good. Happy birthday, Pac-Man! According to Wired, the the yellow man turns 35 today, having first been released upon the world by Japanese company Namco on May 22nd, 1980. We've come a long way together, me and Pac-Man, my ghost-eating friend. Thank you for the memories. Whoa. (laughs) Thanks for the Pac-Man fever. Pac-Man is 35 now. When are you going to turn Ms. Pac-Man into a Mrs.? It's about time. Isn't that what you say to 35-year-olds? Not sure. And finally, sticks and stones may break my bones, but spoilers for my favorite television shows can absolutely hurt me. I'm talking to you, internet troll, who tweeted at me the finale of Mad Men. That was not very nice. Consider yourself blocked and reported for your misdeeds. Thank goodness for the new Chrome extension called Spoiler Alert. Spoiler Alert Spoiler Alert will automatically block websites that contain spoilers of all your favorite TV shows. Spoiler Alert scans content online and blocks what you don't want to see. It helps protect, protect against spoilers from TV shows, sporting events, if you're into that sort of thing, award shows, reality shows, and more. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for this show yet, so you'll just have to be careful what websites you visit. Or else you might find out that this was all a dream. That's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. Watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. On Monday, we'll be celebrating Memorial Day here in the United States, so we will not have a show. There will be something playing, but it might not be me. But I will see you here on Tuesday, May 25th. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. And if you're going to be at Google I.O. in the Bay Area next week, stop by Petaluma and come see a show. You can get tickets by emailing tickets at twit.tv. I am Megan Maroney, and thank you for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.